And he came to America and uh, very delighted and became an artist immediately. His father bought a lot of old buildings and he could stay in the building till they rented it. So he'd move from place to place until they had to get out because they had rented the apartment. And then he found a studio, a friend of his, Rocco, found a studio. They had two studios down on East 6th Street. And that's where he did most of his work, after the, uh, uh, the Lower East Side rentals, which he could never afford to buy or rent. So he lived on East 6th Street for all those years, had a wonderful studio there. He loved it. it was, uh, but everything he'd remake like a concentration camp. It was all black. It was if, difficult to find anything. It was, it, was, it was just terrible. He lived that way all his life. And, he, and no matter how much money he had, he would buy the cheapest thing and uh, live very much like a poor man, even though, because he wouldn't, he felt it was wrong to spend and throw money around and live extravagantly after what had happened. He was very conscious of that his entire life, till his death. He remembered everything, even from his early childhood, and even the people in the camp some of them were very good to him. He was only 16, and they took him under their wing. Although his father was him, with him, one of the carpenters taught him how to do carpentry, which saved him in many ways. And another one taught him how to hide out all day long until it got dark, so the Nazis couldn't find him. And so he learned to sleep all, the, all days and stay up all night. And that's what he did his entire life. He worked mostly painting at night. And all his houses were black walls, and it all looked like darkness, and that's the way he painted. That's, that was his best way of rem rem remembering the Holocaust, his Latvian life, and uh, that he, until he died, he lived in a black studio. Practically every time we saw each other, or something, a reference would come up, he would ask me what I thought of that painting, and I would say something, then he said, remind him of some boy in school, or would remind him of his mother, or the fact that she was a vegetarian. Everything would bring back something from the past, from his sister's life and the sister that was killed. Mother and sister had been murdered at Rumbala, but he remembers something about his mother and how she would tell him about her studies in France and uh, her vegetarian beliefs. Well, he was in the camp for four, for four years. The war time he was in a camp. But before the war, he, the Germans had been there and the uh, Russians had been there. He loved the Russians. The Germans were horrible. He always loved Russians very much. Russian music, Russian literature, Russian poetry. He had a lot, a real Russian heart. And his father was a died in the will uh, businessman. No matter where you stop, put him, he'd become rich again. It happened to him many times. He was rich in Russia. He came to Latvia, became rich in Latvia. Came to America, was poor, got rich in America. He was a born businessman. And Boris, deep down, he must have had it in him because at the end of his life, he decided to make a lot of money because he said, my work won't exist if I don't take care of it. And he needed money to take care of it. So he went on the stock market and became a millionaire. But he didn't pay his taxes, so they took most of it away <laughs> when he died. You know. His mother and sister were sent to Rumbala. First, they were, in a little t uh, they were taken over as Jews in a Jewish community. And he and his father were able to be together, which was a miracle. And his father knew how to do things in the camp. He was able to take care of Boris, sell a cigarette or sell this. He was, became quite an active businessman in camp. And uh, he was always business oriented. And Boris was an artist always. It was of 1961. I had seen Boris's work in one of a group show downtown. And I was very excited by it. I didn't know the artist. I just remembered the name. So Boris flew back from Milan, from Schwartz's gallery, and came to my house. I lived in the lower fifth, I lived in fifth and ninth at that time, in the village, and I met him, and it was a miracle, because he was so much, so much like myself in the way he thought, and uh, what was interesting to him, and the art. I thought he was extremely attractive, and extremely brilliant, and a wonderful human being, and exactly the kind of person I would like to be with. He was just amazing. Just like the, we were like siblings in a sense. We had so much of the same qualities and same attitudes about life and the world. And uh, it was just an immediate friendship that never ended. First time, the first meeting I met him, I knew that he was the right person for me. And he was. We stayed together all those years and uh, 
He had been married before to a very nice girl, Beatrice. I'm still in touch with her, but uh, that didn't last. And uh, she went back to France, and then I met him. And uh, from that point on, we were together. Just a wonderful person to be around. He was so gentle. I think being in a concentration camp makes him aware of everybody's feelings. He just understood the pathos of everyone. And that was the way he was with his friends. And he was just a a wonderful friend and a wonderful person to be with, and certainly he was brilliant. And his work was very exciting to me. I loved his work. We discussed it very often. Well, you know, he slept most of the day, mostly in nightly relations, because he worked mostly nights and the days he slept. He slept because in the concentration camp, the only way you get through the day was to sleep through it. So the night became the most important part of his life. Well, he always remained poor in his life. I mean, even though he could have had as much money as he wanted, his father was money. He was difficult with other people. He was never difficult with me. He, was, he would imagine and want people to live up to their obligations. He wouldn't take a liar. He was very moral, very ethical. He was, uh, he was very sweet and kind to people, and he would help people if he could. But if somebody was tough, like a businessman or a, a worker that was too tough, he was very tough with them. He wouldn't let them get away with anything. He was fascinated by history. He knew the history of the Holocaust. He knew the history of Rome and knew the history of Russia. He, was, he read a great deal. Remember, he never had an education after 16. So he was self-educated in terms of history and geography. He was very good at that, history and geography. He knew the history of the Hebrew people very well. He spoke Hebrew. He spoke seven languages. I mean, he never had any anger about the Germans and the concentration camps. Never talked about that. Uh, as a matter of fact, just an experience he went through and he had no hatred for it. Uh, but uh, he lived a life of a concentration camp victim. It came so early that it was embedded in his life. He said his work emanates from the New York streets. And that's what he believed in. And when he was sick and he was in bed with a bad foot, he saw all these girly magazines, and that's what started him in getting involved with cutouts and pinups and the girlies and the uh, whole, it, it, what they call uh, di definite, di uh, difficult art it was Boris's way of showing New York as it really was. He was very political. He did a lot of political paintings, and he joined some organizations to help other people. But his art was all about pinups and the statement, and Israel, and the Jews, and the Holocaust, and the future of the world, because he worried about it all the time. I mean, he didn't want to see it happen again, as we all didn't. And he would take precautions by joining organizations that were fighting against anti-Semitism, or anti-blacks, or anti even anti-gays, all these people we had to fight against. About art in general, we spoke, I don't think we saw each other when we didn't speak about art. Not his art or some art, but somehow it would come into the conversation. Did you see this one? Did you see that one? And they were an artist, so we talked about their art. You know, it would come in all the time because it was basic. That's what we both agreed and uh, it was easy to talk about. And I get a lot of insights because he knew a lot about art that I didn't. And uh, I enjoyed it very much. And he was always interested in the art world, about the money going on in the art world. He was amazed by it. You know, he was really amazed by a lot of money being spent on anything. Like if I come back from a dinner and uh, he would say, where did you go? We said, well, when he said, well, how, what did it cost? I mean, he was always interested in money. I said, I don't know, I didn't pay for it. So he's always impressed with that, that art dealers didn't have to pay for anything. And he talks about in the, uh, no, in the Anita book, he talks about the art dealer paragraph, which is very interesting. And I enjoyed his work and being his muse, I mean, anything he wanted me to do, I would do, pose any which way. I didn't, I didn't take this seriously. I mean, I had no idea about what is decadent or what's not decadent. It was just what an artist wanted. It didn't bother me at all. People thought it was very strange, but truly I never thought of it as being strange or bad or good. It was just art and Boris is making art. So I did whatever he asked me to do in terms of posing. He considered what he called it, no art, saying no to the establishment, not to be intimidated by the establishment, by the authorized figures who control the situation both economically and socially. He was anti the establishment and no art represented that. A lot of the pop artists were his friends, Oldenburg, Lichtenstein, he knew them. We used to see them at the bar, you know, the Friday night bar was a famous place where we would all meet. 
And he was very friendly with them. He particularly liked de Kooning and Klein and Rothko, the abstract expressionists that preceded him. And they were very friendly toward him and write some very nice things about him. I don't think he felt there was such a thing as pornography. I mean, I mean unless, unless people were using it for uh, unusual things like sadomasochism or uh, pederasty and stuff like that. Pornography was pin pinups. That was considered pornography. So I guess you would have called him a pornographer, but he was not. He was just showing the human side. Most people were very interested in going to clubs where people were undressing and stuff like that. He took no offense at that. I mean, he used to like those nightclubs too. He went to many of those pinup places and, uh, and found them very exciting. They were exciting and they were visual and he used them in all his paintings. But he had nothing against pornography or uh, anything to do with prostitutes. He had no connections, nor did he care or did he promote or did he not promote. It was not in his understanding at all. Pornography is not something he thought about. Nor did he do. He's not a pornographer. He showed the seamier side of the world, but Hustle and Playboy, they were all coming out. There was no difference in Boris and them. It's what people wanted. I mean, it's like people want to smoke or they want to take dope. I mean, it's their, their position to do pornography. What is symbolic meaning he was able to find? Symbolic meaning. The humanity of people, their human needs and human desires and how to make it effective and how to use your life so that you get some pleasure out of life and you're not restricted by the establishment. He really felt one should be open to all this and no restrictions at all. He didn't believe in laws stopping anything, not, not nothing, not prostitution, not sadomasochism. He didn't feel that way. He felt everything should be available to people that want it without hurting other people. He was against uh, things like hurting other people. But sadomasochism, if that was your thing, he had no objection to it. And uh, he would say so he, openly. He didn't want to be one of those people on a string. He believed to do his own thing the way he wanted to, and nobody could stop him. And money was not the answer. He was not interested in making money. He was interested in getting his message across, because he had been through hell. And he wanted to make sure that hell would not keep existing forever. <laughs>